one more? There we go. Okay. Ladies, gentlemen, internet, hello. Um, before we go to beer, uh, I'll warm you up talking about um, design deliverables and one of the most famous del design deliverables that we have. And what is that? The PSD. Right? We use these all the time. How many are designers? Right. Okay. How many use uh, PSDs when designing responsive websites? One, two, okay. And do you find it difficult? Yes, yes, <laughs> PSDs. Do you find it difficult to do? Yeah, and why? Because you have to make so many? <laughs> and the font sizes and everything have to change. In the browser, yes, and we're talking about that because this is a web-based mock-up. They look exactly the same. But this one's in the browser, and the other one's in a PSD. So what's the difference? The difference is, this is the PSD on a small screen. If I import that into a browser, right? And this is the web-based mock-up on a small screen. So you kind of know where I'm going with this, with uh, designing in the browser and all that. So we'll, we'll get into it. I wrote a book called uh, Responsive Design Workflow where I talk about this problem and many other problems. This is, web-based mockups are one of the, the steps in the workflow that are um, really, really important. And one of two things that can replace Photoshop, um, potentially, for this kind of design deliverable. So we have the web-based mockup and the style guides, and those together are enough design information to give to whoever needs it. So you don't really need Photoshop as a a representation of your design anymore. So I'm sorry to tell you that image-based mockups are no more. Well, at least they will be no more. So you can't really uh, continue working the same way that we've been working for many, many years. And the reason we've been working the same way for many years is because the design comps that we've made and still make and I'm sure many of you still make them, but they come from print. So we're using things that we used 20 years ago. So about 20, 21 years ago, um, when I started working in print design, um, let's see, I'm 29 now. So I was eight years old. <laughs> As a child working in an advertising agency, it was very, very uh, <laughs> interesting to learn how to do this type of thing. And we did things... Uh, like this. This was very, very old school. You, some of you might even know this, then you'd have to be as, as young as I am. Um, we sketched things with really, really, really expensive markers. And that's how we presented them to clients. So I had this marker set about that big with, I think, like 300, uh, 300 markers in it. And we had to sketch out what we wanted, um, what the design should be. It was a lot quicker than the way we do things now with the web, making everything meticulously in Photoshop. Very hard to do, it takes a lot of time, and then the client says, no, don't like it, <laughs> change it. And if you do that responsively, that's, that's getting to be a problem, okay? So we did things like this. First sketch, really rough sketches. Um, any designer, well, most designers do this, uh, I s still sketch on paper. I don't jump right into Photoshop or, or jump right into the browser, and I don't recommend that anyone does. Um, then we work them out into each, uh, a little bit better, more detailed uh, renderings, like on the right-hand side. And this is pretty much enough to show a client and say, we, we want to take these types of pictures. You don't have to look for stock photos that look kind of like the pictures you want to take and then have the risk that the client says, yeah, I like, I like that photo, so we'll just <laughs> use stock photos, right? On the other hand, <laughs> this is something that happened to me. I made a kind of drawing like this and the, the client said, wow, I, I like this. And so we're like, well, we have to find a photographer who can do that. He's like, photographer? It's, it's an illustration, right? So he just wanted these drawings, basically. That's uh, crazy. But anyway, <laughs> you have the designer and the medium. And I think every presentation should have some kind of chart 
because it seems like you did a lot of research, um, which I did, of course. And we have the designer, we have the medium. And when you think about which designers, which types of designers work closer to the medium, it's kind of funny because you would expect web designers to do that because we have the possibility to do so. But as far as I know, and I just totally made this up, <laughs> is uh, fashion designers, they're always playing around with the fabric, you know? But they didn't make the fabric. We'll get back to that discussion later on. But they're always playing with the material um, which they design for. Uh, furniture, interior uh, designers do type of the same type of thing. Uh, architects are kind of in between, but they do a lot of uh, scale model type stuff. Uh, print designers know a lot about the medium that they're designing for. Uh, I knew when I did advertising campaigns that if we printed in a certain newspaper that if I wanted something to be black, I had to make it 85% black. And anyone who's done print, anyone? Print design here? Then you probably know things like dot gain and undercover removal and things like that, which are pretty technical. Um, technical things that designers know, wow. Right? And web designers are kind of over here. Uh, we're not even as close to, to the medium as we'd like to be, especially in large organizations where you have uh, all these different silos, people working, a visual designer they call it now, because visual design implies that you only decide what it looks like. And when I learned design at school, we learned that design was communication, solving problems, and not just uh, making a pretty picture. And I'm sure a lot of you who are designers would agree that just calling yourself a visual designer, getting a wireframe from an inter interaction designer that's got all these design choices made in it, and what's left for you to do? Just color it in, right? Put the logo in there, color it in, and um, maybe change the font. But it's pretty much done for you. So unless you can work together with the interaction designer, uh, it's, it's pretty um, important to um, to look at your role as a designer in a different way. It's very important. And you can do that the closer you get to the medium in this case. Um, so not designing pretty pictures in Photoshop, not, uh, not designing in the browser, uh, just sit down, open Chrome, DevTools, and start hacking away. I, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody, although I know some people who do that, um, who are mentally ill. but. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Photoshop. So this is not, I'm talking about replacing Photoshop for design deliverables, the things that you show your client. I'm not saying never use Photoshop. Um, although, people have done some really weird shit in Photoshop, <laughs> okay? I'll give, you, I'll give you a minute to look at this, because I know you want to, <laughs> it's just so weird, you have to keep looking at it, so. It's, it's not as obscene as you would think, <laughs> okay? Just somewhat obscene. Um, oh my God, I can't put that. <laughs> but we do the weird stuff on the web as well, right? This is Jeffrey Zeldman's first website in 1996. <laughs> um, the funny, funny thing is his hair right here. You know, he's got this long hair, well at least the impression of hair. Um, this is great and I think, hold on, it says, Best experienced with Netscape 3.0. <laughs> Don't you love it? So why this whole thing about web-based mockups? Um, I've been talking about this for about three years now. Um, and why do I keep doing that? Because I think it's important. And one example of how important it is is now that we have responsive design. Um, in this case, the time.com redesign, which was responsive, and it is responsive. It's probably not as per performant as uh, a lot of people would like it to be, and there, there are some things that can be changed. But um, they had more than 200 PSD files, okay? And the only way they were able to do that was because they got a lot of leeway from the client to be able to uh, make a lot of decisions themselves. If the client was more involved in making a lot of those decisions, they would have had to change a lot in perhaps many or all of these more than 200 PSD files. And why do they have so many PSD files? Because they have 
for every screen that they're mocking up, they have the small screen and the tablet-ish screen and the, the large screen. Um, so they do everything three times. And then when they're all done and everyone says, that's great, we want it, uh, they give it to developers. And developers can do everything all over again. And then they'll look at it in a browser and say, wait a minute, this looks kind of different than what I saw in Photoshop. <laughs> So that's one of the dangers of Photoshop as well. The funny thing is they say it's not only tedious, but it can produce minor discrepancies between the comps of the same page at different breakpoints. It's amazing that there are only minor discrepancies in there. So why, is, uh, why are web-based mockups important? Because anything that's less than 200 PSDs is great with me. OK. I don't want to be changing to uh, 200 PSDs. As a matter of fact, the whole reason I started doing this workflow uh, stuff is because I did a project many years ago where I had to do maybe 25 PSDs, I guess. It was not a responsive site. It was before responsive design. And just one change, the headings had to be bigger. That took like half a day to do. Because everything, you change the heading, but you also have to change the space around the heading. And that moves something down, which means you have to make the document itself a little bit larger. Um, and you have to move everything under that, move it down. Um, or I don't know Photoshop well enough, but there's nothing like style sheets in Photoshop. And I was thinking, you know what? If this was CSS, I could change like one value on one line in CSS, which is easy to learn, and I would be done instead of spending a half a day doing this. And that was just one correction. You know, then you send it back, and then they come back with something else. Um, we want all the headlines blue instead of red. God, you know, so that's terrible. Um, that's why. They more effectively represent what's in the browser because they are actually in the browser, right? So you can't argue with that. And the thing that's interesting is we have the opportunity, and a lot of people don't have the opportunity. If you're a print designer, hmm. <laughs> if you're a print designer, you can't actually print something on the actual paper and with the press that you want to print on, usually. Uh, just to see what it looks like and see if your, your client really wants you to, to produce that. So you, you can't build a building as an architect. What, you see this fly flying around? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> That's not really a good sign, is it? <laughs> Get away from me. Hold well, on, I, I need a drink. Go over to him. <laughs> So what the hell was I just saying? I, I have no idea. Anyway, right, an architect can't build a building and uh, say, well, don't like it, got to tear it down, build a new building, you know? So you can't do that. One of the problems is that we, with these Photoshop uh, documents, we can make things really, really pretty. Um, we can just, I know all of you have done it. You select something in Photoshop, and then you use your arrow keys, and you're like, tick, 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 tick. <laughs> and now it's perfect. It's perfect. And then um, later on, you have this discussion with the developer. Well, you know, <laughs> I wanted this specifically, like right there. And he's like, "Well, it's in M's and not in pixels." You know, so um, what the hell's an M? Right? <laughs> that's what we thought before. So that's what we show our clients: is the perfect picture in Photoshop, and it looks like this. You know, if you, I'm assuming that you know you like this car, um, maybe not. But this is what they get. <laughs> it's never the same as it was in the PSD ever, ever, ever. <laughs> okay, and then you get this revisions. Like this is actually a site that I designed, right? And um, I put big blocks where all the comments were, so you don't have to read the actual comments. But basically, it was like. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't like the, the logo. You know that joke, make the logo bigger? It's really true. They always do that. Make the logo bigger. Yeah, but what's the problem? I want the logo bigger. No, maybe you want more attention to your brand. No, I want the logo bigger. And I want it that big, please. And you'll have some room for the text here. But what happens when the browser's smaller? There's no browser smaller. I don't want it for the iPad. No one, none of my clients work with an iPad. 
get rid of this, put some Laura Mips in there, because I don't know what's going to be in there. We're not worried about content. Just put some Laura Mipsum in, and I'll, it will count how many words of Laura Mipsum there are, and I'll write something that fits the Laura Mipsum. God, but what's it about? You know? I, I don't know. And then you get these discussions. It, um, you're too expensive. It's taking too long. <laughs> so. All right, so good luck with that kind of thing with three different Photoshop documents for every screen you're designing. Have a nice day. This is cool. You know, the client who says, you know, well, what would it look like in green Comic Sans with a pink background? Um, you, with a web-based mock-up, you can do this in, um, you know, the Chrome DevTools in this case, just change something and show them how terrible their idea looks right away instead of doing what I used to do and uh, take a week to show them how terrible their idea looks. <laughs> okay? Um, and better yet, just say, okay, this is called Chrome DevTools because you think that it's just pressing a button and the website's done. Chrome DevTools, here, go ahead, change stuff. <laughs> so, another thing is version control. Um, who knows version control and who, who knows version control here? Yeah, okay, everyone knows it. Do you use it for PSDs as well? Anyone? Yeah, Dropbox. Dropbox, all right. And the Dropbox is like, what is that, 500 terabytes of uh, PSDs? <laughs> Every little change, okay, I, I saved the new heading change. The what? Google Drive, okay. <laughs> it <went slow. laughs> That's great. Oh man, <laughs> nice idea. <laughs> if you um, you don't make a change in a PSD and then save it and rename it, like this is version one, and then you have to have this like text file hooked up to it that says in version one uh, we changed the heading, and then now we're going to do the next correction. You don't, with normal version control that programmers use. Um, you can do that. You can actually uh, write about every change you made, and it's just text, so it doesn't take up a lot of space, and you could probably hold a whole project uh, on your laptop, um, and all your projects just on your laptop. Um, when, I, when I had uh, my own um, front-end development and design company a few years ago, I had an employee who just organized things. We organized things in folders, because we didn't know about version control yet. This was uh, maybe 10 years ago. And um, there, he was really good with being efficient, so he learned these key combinations to um, be able to uh, like put things in the trash on the Mac. So I think it's uh, um, command, shift, backspace or something, and it throws something away. But he accidentally selected the whole folder instead of, the <laughs> instead of just the Photoshop file that he wanted to throw away. Um, so he threw away the whole project that we'd be wor <laughs> been working on for like two weeks. So then uh, we had to do everything again from scratch, and a week later he did the exact same thing. So, <laughs> and so I had this this genius, you know, this genius developer nerd guy who's like a rocket scientist, and he came in, you know, came out from under his Linux machine, and he <laughs> walked over and he's like, "What are you guys doing?" Well, you know, this just happened. He's like, oh, yeah, why don't you use version control? What? <laughs> what is that? Ground control, version control? I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And he, he said, well, we started using um, subversion, it's called. And that worked pretty well, but we had to get designer people to start using subversion. And we didn't have a lot of Photoshop documents back then because we didn't have responsive design back then. So it wasn't as painful as it is today. Um, so that version control is a big advantage of doing uh, web-based mockups. So how would you make these? Because basically a web-based mockup is a static web page, right? It's HTML and CSS. Um, no JavaScript because we don't want to get too fancy yet. It's just, it's like Photoshop with benefits. Okay, it's just Photoshop, but you can see it in a browser, and it actually scales. It's actually fluid and responsive, um, and it shows the client what they're going to get in the first place. We don't, I don't get to that point. I don't just start in the browser. There's this whole process, the responsive design workflow, where we start with the content and what's going in there. Uh, we do wireframes, uh, which are just 
blocks. We figure out exactly what type of content is going to go into to the page we're designing. Every page you design has to have all that thought put into it. And then we just sketch. Um, sketch as designers do. You could sketch in Photoshop if you're used to sketching in Photoshop and experimenting or whatever. I sketch on paper. Um, I also sketch on, on devices. Um, you have these little things. You, you all have the front, uh, what is it, the front end conference, uh, those pens. I don't know. They had some pens with the stylus on the back. Um, you ha if you have a drawing um, program on your whatever device you have, you can just do this kind of thing. I do it all the time and then export that and you could use it as a background, a CSS background and start placing things uh, on that. Um, so however you sketch, that's the most important thing actually. So uh, design happens, it starts in your head, um, usually moves to paper. And the important stuff, the hard stuff about design, is the thinking. It's not, um, the focus is, is often too much on the deliverable. We're spending a lot of time busy with a tool and, and not with designing and what that tool is able to do. So um, this is just a way to do it. A lot of people sketch in Photoshop, that's fine. So when I gave uh, lectures at um, a college in Holland, the students all sat down and I gave them this assignment to start sketching. And everybody just went to the computer and opened up Photoshop. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> sketching on paper and they didn't uh, go with that. So I thought it's time to, you know, accept that the young people spring right into Photoshop. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not everyone does it the way you do. So I use paper, you use Photoshop, someone else uses fireworks, that's fine. But just not high fidelity, not in all the detail, because you can do that in the browser later on. There's no sense doing it twice. Okay? What's important in making these mock-ups is to use representative content. So we touched on lorem ipsum. That's not representative content unless you know the structure of the content to be able to use lorem ipsum correctly. So if you don't know what's going on the page and you're kind of making a template for your client to fill in, uh, then you're designing blind and you're not really doing design, uh, you're not getting everything out of design, your client's not getting everything out of design, so the communicative aspects of design are, are lost because you don't know what you're communicating, so you have to know. And the workflow goes through the whole content phase first, so you absolutely have to know as much as you can about the content before you start, and that saves a lot of headache at this phase. Um, so, this thing, this doesn't have actual content, but here they're just sketching, and here it looks like they know a lot more about the content that's going to be on the page. They don't know exactly how long it's going to be, and it is possible that someone will actually write to fit in this space that happens a lot in advertising. Um, but this is pretty clear, actually. They, they know that this is, these are like specifications of, of this car right here, and uh, someone's thought about it. And that, that's pretty much how we used to do it. And it's just so easy to take lorem ipsum and paste it in and make just a block that fits perfectly in the space that we have available, <laughs> right? To make it look nice, and it'll never look like that again. And then the client says, "You have these three blocks of text, but they don't line up perfectly on the bottom. Can you make them line up perfectly?" Um, well, there's flexbox, and, and then you can go into this discussion. <laughs> but they'll say, "Well, I'll I'll chop off a couple words, you know," and then they look at it on, a, on an iPad, and then things go to the next line, and you know how it works. So you want to avoid this type of thing by uh, showing them this stuff from the very beginning. This is just a block of lorem ipsum, but you, this is not enough. You have to know if it's that or if it's this kind of structure. So you have to know more about the content, not just what it's about, but what structure it has. And the best thing is to have the actual content. And it, I know that's hard because most clients um, want to develop the content based on what they see. Um, so you have to train them or just bite the bullet. It's hard sometimes, but a lot of them, if you explain why you're doing that, that they'll get a more realistic impression of what they get. They have to write the content anyway. I don't understand why content's not pulled to the very beginning 
of the design process, and it's usually kind of an afterthought content. That's why so many websites suck so bad, and apps as well. People don't think about what, and everything in an app is content as well. If you have a button, it's content. Unless you just have a button with nothing in it, it's just like a red on the screen, which no one has. You have to know what it is, otherwise you can't design appropriately. Okay. Structure is very important. We use um, to make it easier for the client to apply some structure to their content. We talk about markdown, uh, plain text markup, just to have a simple way of uh, of thinking about structure instead of Microsoft Word, where you select um, select text and make it bold and bigger. That doesn't really say anything about what the what the text is, but it's really really important to know what these things are as a as a designer. So things that can help you with speed, because if we're talking about a static web page, and you can make a static web page responsive, um, how can you do it? Your designers, you maybe you don't code necessarily, so in a way I'm implying that it might be useful to learn some code. And as we saw in the last session, some code is not necessarily very hard. If you want to become a front-end developer, that's a totally different thing. Um, but some code, enough code to be able to do some basic typography, colors, a little bit of background, and maybe a little bit of layout, um, that, might, um, that might help. Okay, but we'll, we'll talk about different ways to do it. Um, let's go through all of these uh, one by one. Okay. The one thing I get is a question all the time, well, when we make these mock-ups, can't we just use them for production? Not necessarily. Production code is different than mock-up code. When you're doing a mock-up, the whole idea of those marker renderings we did earlier was to do things fast. You don't know if the client's going to like it. So you have to work quickly, as quickly as possible, but still get your idea across. Still have enough detail that the, the client understands it and that uh, when things change, it's not a complete, completely different thing. So I don't think it's fair when you say, designers, it's useful to learn a little bit of code, to say you also have to do production-ready code. And it has to be performant and it has to be perfect. And if it's not, we're going to be very, very angry. <laughs> It's not, it's not a good way to work. Um, Front-end production is totally different. They worry about different browsers. Uh, they worry about speed. They worry about the style of code. Um, you shouldn't have to worry about that. But if you know a lot about code, there's no harm in making proper code and using that as a web-based mock-up. That's, that's fine, too. Okay? So it doesn't need to be perfect right now. Just quick. Quick, quick, as quick as we can. So how do we do that? Um, quicker than just opening a text editor and typing out everything that you need to type out for um, a website. Um, to do that just for a couple of pages. Uh, static site generators, which you might have heard of. Those are, uh, we have CMSs. Everyone knows what that is with a database behind it on a server. And uh, you... You save things through an interface uh, to the server, and then it gets pulled in to the, to the website. Um, I know people who have done mockups with CMSs, but it's kind of a heavy-duty thing for just mockups. Static site generators are software tools that allow you to um, combine little components together, because once you start working on a web design, Inevitably, um, if you're doing it, if you're doing things the right way, you'll start. Uh, you'll have this system of components that you're designing, actually, and it's not designing pages, but you're designing a, a system, just like an identity system. So, these pieces of software will help you have things that are on every page um, be pulled, be on every page automatically, and you can generate your mockups from the software. You only have to focus on specific pieces of every mock-up instead of every uh, thing. So see it as Photoshop layers. Where you have one layer that's the header and you change the content part and then you have the layer that's the footer and the header and the footer always stay the same. You keep them on the whole time and then you switch the layers and then you export. <laughs> right? And you do that over and over again 200 times. Um, 
these site generators, these are names of them, uh, there are a couple, and they give you a way to just say, okay, I'm going to set up this project, and it makes a, a folder for you that you can put your mockups into. Jekyll is a popular one. Uh, anyone who uh, uses GitHub pages, that's powered by Jekyll. Uh, this was developed by one of the founders of GitHub. Um, a lot of people like it. it uh, everything looks pretty and um, yeah, it works pretty well. These are command line programs. Okay, that means you have to type weird alien code in the terminal. Terminal, oh my god. That's that thing you try to avoid. Every time you see it when you pull up a folder, you're like, oh my god, it's a terminal. Okay. Okay. Get away. But it's okay. Terminals are not very scary. I'll show you one later on. They're very friendly. Um, but you type these things, and this is pretty much all you have to type. Looks weird, but once you know what it is, um, I, yeah, you know, you could probably learn this much, I could probably learn this much German. Wouldn't sound great, but I could try, and that means that a designer who knows a lot about something like Photoshop, which is very a very complex piece of software, we should be able to type these commands in. And you don't even have to remember them. You can like have them next to the computer screen or whatever. And when you do this, it just, it just says install it, uh, make a new mock-up folder, um, go into that folder, and then make a little web server for me so I can go to the browser and um, type in a name and then I get my mock-up, and that's this, you know? Just to give you an idea. It's kind of nerdy, I know, but. This is another one. This is the one that I use. Uh, Dexy, which is great for making style guides as well. And that's a little bit of a different way of typing the, the commands in, okay? And then you can type this thing in your, in your browser, and then you'll get to your mock-up that way. And so now you have this mock-up, but it's empty. You have to fill it. You have to fill it with the HTML and CSS that you, uh, that you make. So these are very handy because it gives you a way to do, to take these different components and work on them separately and have them combined when you run the software. So if, I, if this is all the same on every single mockup, and I'm only changing this, I could have files with just this in it. And if you work together with a developer, he, could set, he or she could set this up and that you only have to work on this part. So that is an interesting aspect of this. Um, not every designer is willing to even learn a little bit of, of code or command line things. So that's why it's so important to collaborate, which doesn't always happen as often as we'd like, um, especially in larger uh, development companies. It's very, it's rare almost to see uh, as, except people who work with Scrum or Agile to, to work together on something. So it's just this assembly line process. You know, interaction designer gives you something, you fill it in, uh, you give that to the developer, uh, they curse at you forever for designing that thing. So, um, yeah, we need to work together. Actually, everyone has to be involved um, at every step of the process. Um, some people will be doing more at certain steps and others will be doing uh, less, but that's just the way, uh, way it goes. Other things that can help us, everything that you don't want to do on actual websites, you're free to do to make your mockups because anything goes as long as you get a mockup that works in the browser the way it's supposed to and looks the way it's supposed to. So um, Marco was talking about frameworks, I totally um, agree with that opinion. I don't like frameworks for uh, front-end code, um, but by all means use any framework that makes it easier for you to do a mock-up because anything you have in HTML and CSS which looks the way you intended and works in a browser is already a big step further than Photoshop and it will save you time in some way. And developers don't have to use your code. Before you gave them a PSD and they had to do everything themselves. So just the fact that you're using HTML and CSS, however you put it together, that doesn't mean that they now suddenly have to have this perfect code. They can, they can do everything the same way that they did before. You're saving time, they're not necessarily saving time. But they'll know a little bit more about what you mean with, um, with an HTML document instead of Photoshop. So I use uh, 
things like um, this, SUSE, which is a, a layout framework for um, SAS, which actually can help some designers who find CSS to be too difficult. There are a lot of little shortcuts and nice things in, in SAS that allow you to write um, more complicated CSS a little bit more quickly than you would uh, otherwise. And you can go overboard with things like SAS, especially for production. But when you're doing a mock-up, um, almost anything goes, really. So you can use SAS and something like this, which makes it really, really easy to make layout, which is probably the thing that does, scares designers who don't code the most. How do I do layout in CSS? Because I know developers have a hard time with it across browsers. We don't have great layout stuff yet, like these three. Um, I've done a lot of uh, talking about Flexbox uh, for years, which is now uh, in most browsers in one form or the other. It's not always advisable to use it in production sites, but it is usable and definitely usable for mock-ups. And it's so easy to do a lot of problematic layout things with Flexbox. So you should definitely look that up. Um, even if you don't know code, if you don't know CSS, it's so easy. Um, it, I'd recommend looking at it. And combined with some colors and little type things in CSS, before you know it, you can do quite a bit with CSS. Grid layout and grid template layout, those are uh, fantastic, especially template layout is my absolute favorite, but they are in, a, in one form in IE10, and they are, um, they are not coming anytime soon in other browsers because they're still actively working on the spec, whereas Flexbox is pretty stable right now. It's just being implemented in more and more browsers. So these are actual CSS solutions for layout. Uh, but until then, things like Suzy or one of the 500,000 million teenth net, uh, frameworks that there are for uh, things, Twitter Bootstrap, everyone asked me about Twitter Bootstrap, so I'll save you the question at the end. Yes, you can use Twitter Bootstrap. Uh, yes, I know that 50% of the whole internet looks like Twitter Bootstrap. That's why you're a designer, you know, you have to change that, but if it makes it easier to make a mock-up quickly and you change it enough so that it doesn't look like Twitter bootstrap, then you have my approval, <laughs> okay? Preprocessors like SAS and LESS, um, which I just discussed, these help you write CSS quicker, and that's what you want, okay? Variables. Um, and mix-ins, yeah, I'm not going to explain that. But variables, say you have a color. One of the annoying things in CSS is that you have to, every time you um, change that color, you have to change it everywhere. And things like SAS allow you to change the color in one place, and then it's changed everywhere that you use that color. So it's, it's brilliant for style guides as well. So I'm talking about tools, but it's not about the tools. We're just searching. This is just, um, this whole process for me came out of my frustration with uh, the, the traditional way of doing things and that it was taking me a lot of time to do it. So I tried to find tools that work for me. I encourage you to do the same. Find tools that work for you. The tools that work for me are not necessarily the tools that work for you. I don't know what's right and what's not right for you or for your team or for your own workflow. Um, so I don't want to pretend that I'm right about that. So it's more about the principle behind it. But these, these tools helped me. And anytime you have a problem, see if there's a tool that can help you. We've kind of stood still as designers, as web designers. But developers, every time they have a problem, um, you know, you ask a developer, well, I had this problem, you know, so I wrote this script. And uh, it works. And I'm like, man, I wish I could write a script. You know, I, I can now, by the way. But, um, and you can too. <laughs> but it's, uh, try to find these, try to think the way a developer thinks. I have this problem, um, how can I solve that in a way that might be using some kind of tool that's outside of my normal field of vision, outside of my, my uh, comfort zone, if you will. Okay, whatever gives you the result you need. The cool thing about web-based mockups is not only that they look great in a, a browser or they look realistic in a browser, but um, uh, you can do a lot of other things with them. Uh, the first thing you can do is present them. And you can present them to clients and developers and anyone you need 
and you have enough information there. So if the developer sees the, the mock-up in different devices, the developer has a lot more information than they would have had with just a flat image. Okay? Um, clients understand that the site is going to look different. The very, very important with, with responsive design is that uh, I know we have things like uh, what Marco talked about, little jQuery plugins that make the text fit exactly. Uh, that's great. If you have a site where it's mission critical that you don't have extra things, you don't have jQuery because it takes, here we go again. But, um, you know, you, you might not want jQuery. It might take too much space. You might need jQuery just to have that plugin. Um, so there are a lot of reasons that you might not be able to or want to use something like that. And what do you do then? It's not a bad thing to accept the reality of the web that things look different. Yeah, we accept the reality of books all the time. You know, the clients found it hard to accept the reality of, of scrolling. I want it all here because I don't want to have to scroll, <laughs> right? So you don't do that with a book. You, you don't say, well, you know, I'd rather not turn the pages. I'd rather just look at the book and have all the information flow up <laughs> through the book to me. Um, that's just, it's just, you know, characteristic of a book. And this is characteristic of the web. The web is this fluid thing. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's, um, it's just sometimes harder to get the courage to, to educate our clients than it is to um, use jQuery and a plugin that we might not even need. So, one thing that I love about web based mockups is that um, you can automate screenshots of, uh, of the designs. And you could do something like this. This is in the command line again. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll try something here. So a little live uh, demo. This is a little script that I wrote. Um, what it does here is it says, go to this website and say that website is your mock-up because you can call it up in a browser. And then I want these breakpoints. These are in pixels, by the way, um, just for example. And this says, take a picture, take a screenshot of uh, this page at all of these breakpoints. You can't do that with Photoshop, so I'll show you what that looks like. This is a little bit tough to, to do here. I'm kidding. <laughs> this is, I'm not really going to do that live. <laughs> But you just type this in. You saw that in that folder there was, uh, there was just one thing. That was this script. This is a little, that Casper.js is a program that runs that script. And it runs it in a browser, a special kind of browser that you can't see called a headless, headless browser, for those of you who don't know what that is. And then it made a folder for me called mockup. And it has, it took the screenshots. And these are the screenshots. And, this is just a video of something that I did this afternoon. And this is how, fat, how long it took. So it's like in a couple of seconds. Instead of going into your browser, using a little like Chrome extension for taking a screenshot of the page and then saving it, giving it a name, doing that again, making your browser smaller, doing the same thing. So you don't want to do that. You want technology. Uh, developers do this kind of thing for testing. And we're saying, hey, smart developers, that's cool. I want to use that kind of cool stuff, too. Um, why would you do this? You just made a mock-up in HTML. Why would you then suddenly uh, make a screenshot of it? Because the first time you show, so, show something like this to a client, if they see it in a browser on a device, the focus is on different aspects of design. There are too many aspects of design at work. There's interaction. There's some kind of functionality. Can I click on this? Can I not click on this? At first, you want to focus the discussion on the, the visual design. Do you like the, the mood, the look and feel? Does this fit with the, the, with the brand, with the message you're trying to get across? Does this look enough like the type of app that you want or not? And then you avoid any discussions about functionality by um, showing screenshots of your design first, okay? Even though you already made it in the browser. And then when they like it, you say, 
uh, okay, we're going to go back and, uh, you know, take some time and put this in a browser for you. <laughs> okay. And when you do that, you can do live demos. And few things are more impressive than going in and showing your design on the client's own device and maybe a bunch of devices that you take with you. So if you're, if you're touting responsive design and you're promoting it and you work that way, um, you almost can't just design statically. You have to show what this will look like in browsers and you have that opportunity. And it doesn't necessarily take more time than Photoshop except for the initial learning curve. And if you have that initial learning curve, you can be helped by working together with front-end developers who, who do this. Another thing is usability testing. Right? You can start doing real usability testing on these things. Not that they're prototypes, not that everything works when you click on it, um, but you can find out a lot more about what works and what doesn't. Interaction designers tend to like it because uh, traditionally they make a wireframe quite detailed and then they give it to a visual designer and then they're done. But all the decisions have been made. What if those de decisions are wrong or that you find out in the browser that it doesn't work the way you thought it would from the beginning? If the interaction designer is involved the whole way and you do testing in the browser, then you might come to different conclusions and you can uh, change things appropriately even before the client sees the design. Another thing is you can use them as a base for a style guide. Um, uh, Hans had a talk about style guides today, and there are lots of ways to make style guides, but uh, the way I do it with that tool, Dexy, is that you just um, put little comments in your CSS or in your HTML that, that pull out a piece of the page and put it automatically into a style guide for you at of the place you specify. And then you can just write a document. Even if you're not the one writing the style guide, someone can write the style guide and put little placeholders in there for all these elements that you want to show. And Dexy will pull those elements out or make screenshots of just those elements and pull them automatically into the document for you. Which means that if you change the color of headlines, and you run that software, your style guide has changed to reflect the changes that you made in your mock-up as well. Okay. So I wrote, I, I did a presentation about that last year at Smashing Conference. Style guides are the new Photoshop. Um, there's a video of it, but there are also slides, and um, I talk a little bit more about the approach to making style guides um, in combination with these kind of web-based mock-ups. So. You'll need some knowledge of the medium for which you're designing, which isn't weird. If you're designing for print, you kind of have to know something about print. Same thing for the web. Same thing for um, you know, people who design buildings, such as the one we're in. It's pretty useful that they know what they're doing, <laughs> right? So that doesn't mean you have to know everything, right? Um, I know this discussion has come up recently. Again, it comes up like every six months or so. Uh, should designers learn how to code? What does that even mean? Should designers learn how to program? Probably not, unless they then they like to. Should they learn a little bit of code? I don't know if they have to, but it might be might be useful to do so. Um, I'm I'm a school designer. I never went to any kind of like computer, whatever. I just learned that. Um, I learned all of this that really nerdy shit, <laughs> right? I learned that, I just taught myself that, and when I didn't know, I asked people because I saw how quickly I could do things. And I've literally saved four to five times the amount of time on certain projects that I would have spent uh, if I had been doing everything the way that I used to do. Uh, to me, that's worth it. But you don't have to learn how to do everything. You don't have to become a developer. So just forget about that whole debate. We have this tendency within the web development community to say, should, you, uh, should designers learn how to code? It's either yes or no. <laughs> you, know? you either learn how to code or you don't. There's no in between. You know? There's no learning maybe a little bit of CSS, just enough to kind of play around and um, know what you could do with transforms or anything like that, so that, you, so that you can design even better for your next project because you know what's possible. Or, or just, 
sitting down with a developer and, um, and learning more about it. So just forget that debate. Don't get involved in these kind of discussions because they're just troll discussions, basically. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to learn how to program. Okay? This is about not learning how to code, but just um, hoping that designers will start thinking outside of the, the realm of the way we've been doing things. Designers look everywhere for inspiration. They look at, um, you know, they listen to music, they look at architecture, they uh, look at photography. Anything can be inspiration for a designer uh, in the same way that it is for a musician or an artist. Um, but we can also apply that to the way we work and not just the work that we do. So that's, that's something to think about. Okay? Learning a new approach might benefit you in some way. Um, how far you learn it, what you learn exactly, that's up to you. Um, but hopefully, you'll see that uh, web-based mockups are just more, uh, a little bit more, a lot more than just uh, a pretty picture. Okay. So, consider them. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have some more time before moving to the party. If there are some questions, if that's okay with you. Yes. You can. Uh, for the internet people. Do you mind we're just uh, yes. summarizing? Yeah. Right. For the internet people, um, the question was uh, Have I considered using tools like Axure, which is a prototyping tool, um, to do these types of mock ups because it's possible to do um, them with these tools? Yes, I have considered it. I know about Axure. Um, I, I personally don't like those tools. That's why I don't use them. Um, I don't like them because they. Uh, the tool is doing something for me and you can't always be sure when you're using a tool if that tool uh, allows you to do the things that you would be able to do if you were otherwise using just plain CSS for example. Um, so you have to you be able to know the tool and kind of know what CSS is possible or what's possible with CSS um, so you kind of have to know two things. And then once you move to a new tool, you have to learn a new tool. So I, I found that it's, uh, those kind of things are, uh, I don't feel like learning tools that I don't know already. So that's for me personally. I, I know CSS. Um, a lot of my work is CSS. So for me, this was more natural. For you, action might be more natural. And I've heard that before. And people are talking about things like Twitter Bootstrap is too hard for me. There's this visual tool called DivShot. And there's another thing called Webflow that uh, just came out recently. Um, I think things like Webflow might be more interesting because they're, um, they're already uh, in the browser. Um, they're, uh, they will actually make something that's also viewable in the browser, but it's just not for me. Yeah. Right. That's, um, part of the workflow is that uh, interaction designers use things like Axure to, um, to create these uh, elaborate clickable wireframes that you could almost say are prototypes, actually. The problem with I have, that I have with the whole workflow, and this was just about the mock-ups, but I have a huge problem with that workflow. And the problem is that design decisions are being made at that point. Um, design decisions that might be, um, you can't design an interaction fully just by making a wireframe. Anything you do visually will have some kind of influence on your interaction. If you're, if you're designing interaction now and you, uh, you do the visual stuff later, uh, 
then that's okay, I guess, but then that wireframe should not be a client deliverable. It should be an internal deliverable. The problem is we show that wireframe to clients, and the client makes all these inferences about the interaction, which might not be true, because just the placement of color on the page might influence the way you interact with these things. Everything is interaction. In a way, we're all interaction designers. Um, that's the problem I have with that approach, um, which kind of led me to choose a different way to do it. So um, it's, not, uh, it's not an approach that everyone agrees with, my approach is not what everyone agrees with. Because obviously, if they did, everyone would do it my way. <laughs> I'm bypassing elaborate wireframes. The wireframes I make are, um, I call them content reference wireframes. So you have a, a content inventory, which should be done first. And then you have boxes on a page in the browser. These boxes are responsive. Um, and you, you pay attention to relationships of content. Each box has a label that corresponds to your content inventory. And that's it. That's your wireframe. And it's responsive. So you can say, now, when we look at this on a laptop, how does that content relate to each other? What's the hierarchy? What's more important than other things? And does that hierarchy and relationship uh, work? across these different devices without worrying about exactly what content it is at that point. It's just, uh, it's quick. You get kind of the same effect. Um, you learn a lot about your content and it takes literally like 10 or 15 minutes to do, um, to do one of those. And anyone can make one of those wireframes in the browser, even if you know, like, no CSS. Um, I could teach you that in like three minutes, enough CSS to be able to do that. So I know it's different. I see. I see how you. <laughs> <laughs> We're also going to have beer. Are you going to the party? <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, that's something. First of all, thank you very much, Stefan. Thank like, you. It was really great talk.